Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tammy, I want to thank you for probably one of the finest uh, introductions I've ever had. And in fact, if I knew how to use Facebook, I would like you right away. That was such a, a great, a great thing. Let me uh, welcome all of you this evening to the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. I'm so honored that you would join us. Uh, and we are so pleased to be hosting this event this evening and tomorrow. I'll tell you that um, for many years uh, in the bank here, we have hosted events like this for bank CEOs throughout our region and talked about issues that affect the economy, that affect the banking industry. And so that's not new. But unlike, not unlike other industries, when we would look out at the audience, we would notice very few women and minorities uh, from the banking industry. And so it's been really in the past two years that we decided to take a sort of different approach to some of these events. And that we would be more intentional and specific about inviting women and minority bankers. We think that the visibility, the networking, and an informed understanding of the issues that we face in banks are key to future leaders for this industry. <clears throat> I'll also tell you that I think the business case is not a hard one. It is quite compelling when you think about it. In fact, as an institution with a public mission, the Federal Reserve serves a very diverse constituency, and so do you as bankers. And so having diverse leaders and employees in our organizations is essential. And by doing so, we are better able to serve the needs of current and future customers and to earn the public's trust. So tonight, I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the challenges that I see facing the banking industry. These are issues that are also affecting the Federal Reserve. And as I look out at you, individuals who are on a path to either currently serving in important leadership roles or on your way to those in your own banks, I hope that this sort of discussion helps you better understand the issues and that you are better able to shape your bank's response to them. So two things before I get started uh, with some of my thoughts. The first is to give you a standard Federal Reserve disclaimer that says the comments tonight are my views and are not intended to reflect the views of others in the Federal Reserve System. And the second is something that someone told me about what makes for the best after dinner remarks. The shortest ones. And so I'm going to stick to that wise counsel this evening. So many of you know that the Federal Reserve has what I call three primary jobs um, in our role in the economy. One is setting monetary policy for the nation. One is making sure that we have a safe and sound banking system in this country. And the third is making sure that the payment system in the United States is safe, that it's accessible, and that it is efficient in its operation. You might also know that most of the time, the combination of those three things sort of run in the background of the economy, and they often go unnoticed, but that is not the case today. Across each of those three core functions, there are significant developments that have captured public attention, and that directly affects the banking industry. And so I'm going to talk about each of those three functions in the context of what I see the issues are across them and the intersection that they have with the banking industry. And let me start first with monetary policy. You know that last week uh, my colleagues and I met uh, in a setting we call the Federal Open Market Committee meeting. Those meetings are designed to spend a couple of days talking about how we see the economy. There's 17 of us around that table, and you get 17 uh, representations of what's going on in the U.S. economy. 
Sometimes you will hear things that are very familiar. Sometimes you will hear things that are different based on how our regions look that we represent. But the job is to sort of synthesize that information, make an outlook on the economy, and then we have to make a decision, which is how is monetary policy situated relative to the outlook for the economy? And of course today, the question is, is it time to raise interest rates in the United States? The decision on that last week, of course, uh, by a seven to three vote was a decision to hold on interest rates, to continue to see whether the economy wouldn't turn in further evidence of its forward progress, both in the labor market and around inflation. Um, and that, of course, is what we all want to see on that committee. We want to continue to see the consumer be strong in this country. We want to continue to see people come into the labor force and that jobs will be added to the economy that reinforces uh, the consumer's ability to spend. And we want inflation to remain low and stable uh, in the United States. Of course, we come at that uh, decision-making process with a diversity of views, as you might imagine. And I think that is healthy for this organization. I happen to be one of the three that argued that it was time to continue the process of normalizing interest rates. That does not mean that I am interested in seeing the economy slow down. It does not mean that I don't care as deeply as others that we continue to see the workforce grow and people to come into that workforce and get jobs. But it comes from a view that as the economy continues to make progress, we need to slowly but surely make progress in adjusting that interest rate so that we don't get far behind and have to take actions later that can actually cost us achieving the objectives that we set out. So of course, these are challenging conversations to have and it is challenging publicly uh, in some cases. There are people today that are not enjoying some of the progress that we've made in the economy. And it's hard for them to understand when you talk about raising interest rates, how that could benefit them. So the discussion around the table is designed to ensure that the diversity of views come out, that that affects uh, the quality of the decision making there. But of course, we know in the banking industry, this is one of several industries that finds it harder to do its job when interest rates are this low for this long. Banks rely on a margin to be able to serve their customers, to be able to cover their cost, and we know this has been a particularly challenging time for the banking industry in that respect. And so uh, as we move forward, we will continue to debate these issues on when is it time to adjust monetary policy. The second area that the Fed is involved in and continues to be very much in the public eye is the issue of how banks are regulated today. You all um, are in an industry where I don't have to say much about that because you deal with that every day. You understand particularly that since 2010 when Congress passed a fairly massive regulatory reform bill which was aimed at really shoring up some shortcomings um, in the regulation of financial institutions, particularly around consumer protections, particularly around capital regulations, um, making sure that when the largest institutions in this country get in trouble, that there is a process for resolving them. All of those things were part of the package that was designed to strengthen our financial system. At the same time, though, we hear on a regular basis that that regulation is having disproportionate effects on the banking industry, and particularly community banks. Smaller banks are struggling under some of this regulation, particularly at a time when they are struggling with low interest margins and a low interest rate environment. And so, again, we are now six years out. The Federal Reserve and other banking agencies are still implementing some of these rules. 
And at the same time, we're beginning to hear calls for the repeal of some of this regulation or uh, some relief around this, at least for certain parts of the industry. So issues around the Fed's role as a supervisor and a regulator in this space has caught the public's attention. And I know it has caught the attention of the banking industry because this is a particularly challenging time, both to digest new rules, to understand how to comply with them, and to look ahead to see whether there may be some relief, particularly as it relates to community banks. The third area that involves the Fed's role has to do, as I said earlier, with the payment system. The Federal Reserve for um, its 100 years plus of existence has been involved in the U.S. payment system. If you go downstairs in our lobby, you'll be able to look right into the vault where we distribute cash to financial institutions. Cash remains a very important part of the U.S. payment system even today. But all of you are well aware that the payment system is beginning to evolve rapidly and has been for several years. In fact, over the last 20 years, households and businesses have gotten quite fond of e-commerce. The ability to buy and sell on the internet has created growing demands for being able to pay for those things electronically. And so we've seen over the last decade real change in this space, not just in the banking system, but frankly, moving outside the banking system, more innovation in that payment system. And the question it raises for the Federal Reserve is, is that payment system safe? Will it continue to earn the public's confidence in a way that will allow people to make the payments they want in new ways, in ways that technology allows them to, but in a way that can limit some of the real risk that are out there. And so about a year and a half ago, the Federal Reserve engaged with the private sector. This is not new. We do this from time to time, where we will sit down with those that are either innovating in this space, with the banking industry that is running this payment system. And we've asked the private sector to think about how we can achieve outcomes in this country for a faster payment system and one that is secure. And so there are two task forces that are working today to look at those issues. One that is focused on sort of the mechanism for how faster payments will be made and one that's focused on making sure that those payments are secure. And over the next six months, you'll be hearing more from those two task forces about how they see the future of payments in the United States. And the Federal Reserve, of course, will also be watching very careful as we engage with them. So if you take those sort of three areas, the challenges we face in monetary policy, the ongoing challenges in making sure we have a safe and sound banking system, and a payment system that is changing rapidly, you can understand why those issues today have raised the visibility of the Federal Reserve's role in those and, frankly, public questions about the work that we do in that space. If you go back to 2010, you would find that Congress began to look to the Federal Reserve for some things that are fairly unusual in terms of government looking to their central bank. In 2010, Congress looked to the Fed to fund two new government agencies, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Office of Financial Research. In 2015, Congress reached into the Federal Reserve to fund the highway bill. Those are really extraordinary sorts of uses of the central bank to fund fiscal uh, payments like that. And of course, over this five-year period or so, there have been ongoing calls for sorts of reforms to the Federal Reserve, and those have been fairly wide-ranging, reforms that talk about whether the Federal Reserve is structured in the way it should be. Does it need 12 regional banks? Does it need 12 Fed presidents that are chosen by private boards of directors to serve? all the way to does Congress need to adjust how the Federal Reserve makes its monetary policy decisions. There are also questions about the role of commercial banks relative to the Federal Reserve and how they work within the Fed structure. 
And I'll remind you that one of the reasons that there are 12 independent Federal Reserve Banks is that the capital stock is supplied for us by the banking industry, and it serves as sort of a foundation for this decentralized structure and gives us the separate corporate status that we have. And it's this structure that provides several things that are really unique to the way the United States thinks about central banking. One of those is it allows private citizens from diverse backgrounds in this country, from the largest to the smallest communities, to have input to national economic policy. It also allows for strong and varied independent perspectives and allows them to more easily emerge in what I described earlier is what can be some very difficult discussions about the stance of monetary policy. And importantly, this structure historically has provided a sort of insulation from short-term political pressures and allowed the central bank to carry out its role. And as I've said in the past publicly, when you begin to alter this private public structure in favor of one that is a more fully government institution, it begins to diminish these defining characteristics in my view. And I think it also puts at risk having more distance between Main Street and the nation's central bank. And I think that could have consequences that we should think about carefully. So let me close, before I take your questions, just by saying that um, these are certainly challenging issues for the Federal Reserve as we look across these three core missions of the Fed. And each of these, of course, has specific implications for you and for your banks. And so when I think about the program that uh, you will engage in tomorrow, I hope that as you listen to the speakers that you will take away some inspiration, that you will take away some context for how you think about these issues in your own organization. Tomorrow you will hear from the deputy chair of my board here in Kansas City, Rose Washington, who will kick off the program. You will also hear from a number of Federal Reserve staff who will talk about some of the issues in each of these areas that I've referenced. You're also going to hear from some leaders in the banking industry um, who are here with us, leaders in the private sector who will talk about development, um, that uh, developing yourselves as leaders. And we will close the day with remarks from the chair of the Federal Reserve herself. And so it's my hope that this experience, that this approach that we are taking today to talking about issues in the banking industry will be beneficial to you, will help you become the kind of leader that will help us address these issues as we go forward for the banking industry and for the public more generally. Thank you very much for being here. So I think we have time for a few questions uh, before I let you uh, get back home and get ready for tomorrow's program. But um, please, any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. Yes, please. Microphone coming your way. Thank you. Reggie Smith, uh, Bank of Kansas City, uh, Madam President, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your being here and all that the Fed does as well. Uh, and the three areas you talk about are really three strong areas uh, that, that, that affects us. You know, uh, one of our fastest growing departments, of course, is compliance as a result of the Frank Dodd Act, uh, just from that standpoint. But all those things come into place. And you and your previous president, the previous president, Ms. Tom, uh, talked about uh, the open market committee about raising rates for years. And being on the mortgage side, I'm glad you lost, but that, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not what I want to discuss that's okay. today. Well, that's okay. I'm going to keep trying, away. Reggie. <laughs> yeah. What I'd like you, could you explain to us a little bit about the political, or should I say non-political statue of the Fed, since the Fed's uh, officers are appointed for a great portion, yet uh, there's discussion about one of the governors, you know, making a donation. Is that right or wrong? Uh, where are we staying going forward? How does the... Fed stay out of politics, yet still be political. If you could address that a little bit more, I would yeah. appreciate it. 
That's a very good question, Reggie, and I appreciate you raising it. Um, so the issue about political influence on the Fed um, is one, as you mentioned, it came up just today when the chair was testifying to Congress. So there are two things that I would observe about this. First of all is by design, the central bank in the United States, and this is true of some other central banks, it is important that, and I'm going to give you just a very crude shorthand of what it means, you don't want those that spend the money to be able to influence those that print the money. And in countries where that influence has been present, you find poor economic outcomes for that country. So the idea that you have an independent central bank, one that is not, can be insulated somehow from these political pressures in the short run, so that it can make decisions for the long run that sometimes may not suit politicians' interests or others in the country. So you want to be able to have those independent decisions made in the interest of the long run. To be fully accountable to Congress, which the Federal Reserve must be, but that sort of political insulation allows the Federal Reserve to make hard choices about what is in the best interest of the economy in the long term. So for the Federal Reserve, that comes in a couple of ways. For those that serve on the government portion of the Federal Reserve, that's called the Board of Governors, the President of the United States selects those individuals. They go through a confirmation process in the Senate. And they are given, generally, 14-year terms. So those long terms were designed to keep any single administration from having um, undue influence on those appointments. So that's one aspect of how the law arranged for that. The other was to sort of create a check and balance to that, and that was to have 12 regional feds whose presidents are not, I'm not selected by the president of the United States. I'm selected by the directors of my board, and their recommendation goes to the board of governors for approval. Without their approval, it can't happen. I can't have this job. But if they approve, then you fill that role. And so now you have 12 banks that don't have any political connection, per se, and again, designed to be a sort of insurance against political pressures that might occur. So the structure of the Federal Reserve was designed to address the question that was raised today about what political influence comes. I will tell you from my five years of experience participating on the Federal Open Market Committee, it is an apolitical discussion, meaning we do not talk about how elections are going to turn out. We don't talk about what helps one side or the other. We are really focused on what's happening in the economy, and what should we do for the economy in the long run. The second thing I will mention, because you raised the question about making donations. And of course, it is legal. There is something called the Hatch Act that allows government employees to be able to make such donations. But there is another aspect to what the Federal Reserve is always very, and has to be very sensitive to, is what kind of an appearance is created with what we do. And so one of the things we do here at the Kansas City Fed through our code of conduct is to remind people the letter of the law is important. You have legal rights for sure, but we are always thinking about what is the perception from the public? Am I doing something that I may be doing innocently enough, I may be doing legally, but how does it look outside here? And I think it's important we're sensitive to that because the public's trust is essential to the Federal Reserve. So. Um, those are the ways in which uh, we think about some of these things and why is it imp it's important for how effective the Fed can be um, in some of the decision making it has to undertake. Good question. Sure, sure. 
Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chairman. I'm Harold Butler from Citigroup. Good to meet you. Thank you for your comments and for this exceptional event. This is just really great. It's, it's very well done, and uh, I, I'm very eager to be here tomorrow. Uh, my question uh, for you is I'd like to get your perspective, if you share with your, your thoughts on that great bill, Dodd-Frank, that we all love so much, specifically uh, the provision 1073 underneath it. I'm, I'm interested to know if that has had, in your view, a material impact on your district. Have you heard from banks, small community banks and the likes, as to whether or not 1073 has been harmful to their business. I'm glad this is a non-attribution session because I, I believe Elizabeth Warren said that she didn't believe it had any impact on uh, small minority uh, banks across the country. So I'm just interested if in your district you've seen, what have you seen? Remember, this is a... a hundreds and hundreds of pages. So I'm going to ask you to remind me 1073 yes. is. Is it on? Okay. Yes. Sorry. I should have done that. Uh, for, for your <laughs> you benefit. You just have to live with this every day. I've been telling Actually, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't. But uh, for your benefit and certainly uh, everyone in the room, 1073 in short is the provision under Dodd-Frank that deals, it's, it's payments oriented obviously, but it deals with the transparency of the payment. So for large money center banks who have you know, large complex systems that can provide the transparency from a payment originating out of the United States that may go to Guatemala and all the steps in between, that value chain, 1073 says that you have to expose that now. And so I, had, I was under the impression that in particular small banks, uh, women-owned, minority, community, et cetera, would have a very tough time meeting that provision because it's tough enough for large money center banks. So that, that's in short, it's a little more complex than that, but that's essentially what it is. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm gonna answer uh, the question this way, which is uh, your example of that provision as well as many others as um, large and small institutions look to comply with the law uh, can struggle with. And we know that even prior to Dodd-Frank, smaller institutions carry a disproportionate share of the cost. So they're not able to spread out the cost of compliance over um, an asset base to hire uh, some of the expertise that larger banks can do. I also am reminded when I look at the preamble to that legislation, that legislation is reflecting what happened in 2008 and 9, and its aim was really to, in shorthand, end too big to fail. It was designed to try to bring some uh, level plane to the idea that there were a group of institutions by virtue of their size and scope that could derail an economy the size of the U.S. So, Many of the provisions of that law were really aimed toward the most systemically uh, risky institutions in the country to try to do that. And when you overlay that, whether it's with uh, making sure that your anti-money laundering rules, making sure that all these, uh, we know from talking to community banks that this is a greater challenge for them and that some of these issues which emanate from those that have very large systems, complex systems, to try to pull this data together relative to these small ones has presented a sort of burden. And of course, the concern about that in the longer run is that smaller banks have been the traditional engines of lenders to small business. This is not about trying to keep small banks viable because Main Street is a sort of nostalgia for the United States is because we know small banks serve a certain segment of the economy that produces jobs, that produces the sort of economic growth that we want in the United States. So policymakers will have a challenge uh, as we go forward to figure out how to make sure that we have large banks that are safe and sound and can carry out the important role they have and that the smallest banks in this country also are able to extend credit and serve the communities they do. 
So this is a particular challenge uh, for policymakers today, members of Congress, as they look at these issues. Anything else this evening? You really do want to keep this short and sweet, don't you? I guess we'll keep this table moving, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you guys got together on this. That's good. Um, again, I share their sentiment. Thank you for having this event. Uh, my question is uh, pertaining to you were speaking on speeding up the payments industry, but also the challenge of keeping payments safe. Um, as we know, just last what, Friday, uh, same day ACH came about. And so, you know, we're working through that. But uh, I guess my question is more so, uh, what what sort of um, um, okay, what sort of firms are you working with to not only help you know speed up the payments, but also you know what what is the Fed doing to make sure these payments are safe? Because you know we have return windows and, and things to honor in, in regards to any payments that may be fraudulent. I'm glad you asked that question because at the outset of this initiative, which was to look at the public is wanting more real-time payments. We want to use mobile means to transact those. That We had to think about that because we know the technology allows it. We know that that is likely to be uh, quite possible. But the question is, how do you think about security? And every day, just about, we read about some sort of breach or event that uh, we'd like to avoid. We can't assure that, but we'd like to avoid. So in inviting people to participate in this effort, of course, we knew the banking industry should be core to these task forces, both on the faster technology approach as well as on the task force looking at security. We have small banks. We took mid-sized banks as well as the largest banks as part of that. We went to consumer groups. We thought it was important that people that represent consumers, whether they are unbanked or underbanked, uh, to help think about how that would work. We took innovators. We took those that are creating uh, some of the newest kinds of technology and believe that they can solve for this. So there was a wide range of uh, interested parties that we invited to the table, some 500 in total, people that think about security every day people from the U.S. Treasury who are concerned about how payments they make, Social Security and paying people in government. So it is a broad cross-section of what I call the payments ecosystem that is focused on looking at the capabilities of technology but making sure that we include with that issues of security. Some of those are probably going to affect current systems, thinking about how we can do a better job of sharing information on some of the things that happen with our current technology, as well as thinking about this for the, for the larger group. So there are many experts uh, that have come together. They collectively developed criteria for what they thought a system would look like and uh, how it would need to meet those. And frankly, in the next couple of weeks, uh, I suspect you'll be hearing more about how their review of some of the proposals that have come out of that are going to meet both security requirements as well as the technological capabilities that will come with that. So, very important. All right, I'm happy to take one more unless you're ready to go home. All right. President George over here. Sorry. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jenny Neal with MBH Bank. I thought since this is a minority-themed forum, you might give us a little bit of background about how you got started in banking and, and your career. I think that might be interesting for some of our younger women in the group. All right. Thank you. Um, I got started in banking at a pretty young age. Um, I grew up on a farm. And if you know anything about farming, one of your closest partners is a bank. And so um, I would go with my dad to the local bank, sometimes to deposit money and sometimes with his handout uh, asking to borrow money. And one of my first jobs was at a bank. Uh, I thought it seemed like a 
cleaner job than the ones my dad gave me on the farm. <laughs> Certainly was cooler in the summertime. Um, and so that was really my first introduction. When I came to the Kansas City Fed in 1982, um, it was as a bank examiner. And um, my, the things I learned as a bank examiner, um, I will tell you to this day, have served me well. What do I mean by that? You had to go into a bank and be prepared. You had to go in and understand the institution. You had to listen carefully. And sometimes you had to deliver hard information and you had to be sure that you had done the first two steps of being prepared and listening carefully before you did that third step. And so that experience not only taught me about the mechanism of banking, how monetary policy flowed through the, the economy, through the banking system, uh, it also taught me about incentives around risk and how those manifest themselves under different scenarios uh, in the banking system. So that was my introduction to banking. That was sort of my path here at the Kansas City Fed. And um, I was well served uh, by that experience. I worked in an organization, um, the Kansas City Fed, uh, for someone who believed in focusing on merit who believed that people that were able to do the job should have the job. And so um, I was fortunate in that sense to have many opportunities here uh, to do things that I enjoyed, things that um, I was able to be successful at. So um, I'm grateful uh, for the leadership that I worked under here. So anyway. Thank you all for being here. I will uh, be with you tomorrow, and I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow's program, and I look forward to the contributions that all of you will make uh, to that program. So have a good evening, and we'll see you in the morning.